Hello, Internet. We are back today, and I can tell you, man, I'm excited because we're going to talk history. Now, you people can say to me, history, are you boring people? I won every single prize in my schools for history. I was the best history student they've ever seen. But I'm not joking. But I won every book quiz to be a one. And then I won money. And I would use that money to go to the CNA. I don't know if they still exist. And then I would actually buy more history books. And I always say, if you don't have at least a thousand history books lying around, you're not that educated. But anyway, I'm just joking. I'm just joking. But I'm excited to, to speak to a PhD in history. It is Dr. Jakub Seinenhout. And you're very welcome here, Doctor. I'm glad that you are here. He's very from my... Well, I'm, I'm a bit scared to say it's my hometown, but uh, I did matriculate in, in, in uh, East London. And I did live in Kanubi for a while. That's why I started my police career. And it's a place which Rebecca likes the most in South Africa is actually Kanubi. She's never seen Cape Town, by the way, but I told her it's, uh, it's not for us. Long story about <laughs> things like Cape Town. But I want to say to your people the following. Okay, firstly, you would have seen I'm sitting again in my gym. I'm not in the usual studio. We're building a toilet there below the studio. It's one huge noise, so I ran over here. But I want to explain to you in a practical term, and I don't know if a doctor will agree with me or not, but history is essential. It is extremely important. Where I worked in the shadows, we write at history degrees a lot more than, than legal degrees, which of course I have. Because we believe, and I still believe, if you know your history, you know the future. Human nature is such that it just repeats, repeats, and repeats. And let me give you a silly example. You meet this wonderful woman. And she, she likes you. And so now you wake up the next morning with breakfast. And through the night, you've heard something she said. She likes bacon and eggs. And the eggs must be, you know, well done. And, you know, and so you've been at the first date or second date. I don't know where these things happened in these times we're living. But anyway, now you make her this breakfast. Eh? Bacon, eggs, man. And you arrive. And she says to you, I'm a vegan. Your history was wrong. Therefore, your actions were wrong. And that is why history should be so correct. It should be 100% correct as it happens so that the future generations can learn from it. And that's why I'm so passionate about history. But now I'm going to keep quiet. Doctor, you're welcome. Let me say once again, let me ask you, where did this start for you? Where does this passion for, for history come from? And before you say, I just want to say to everybody, the man is a lecturer at the university. He's not speaking on behalf of his university, right? He's just here because he's got a YouTube channel, and you should go and look at that YouTube channel, and you will learn something. So, now, your turn. Tell me, where did this happen? Chris, bye, thank you. This is a real honor. Um, yeah, it's a Groot eer om hier te wees. Um, and uh, again, uh, let me just preempt this uh, by just uh, apologizing uh, for you. And as my Afrikaans switch naar Engels to, as I believe, uh, ons doen het maar, koos sê, dis reg, so dis reg. Um, <laughs> my uh, my, my um, interest in history actually started uh, much like courses. Uh, we were talking about it starting when we, when we were uh, little young, little lighties. Um, to act, uh, a queen sinky was from second three year out. Um, it was on second year, no younger. Uh, we were in Berlin at the fall of the Berlin Wall. Um, and there's actually a photo of, of me uh, standing with my older brother when uh, we, we, we were standing at the wall and uh, my brother just, my brother and I, I actually held a tire lever and he took a spanner and we, uh, we managed to hit a piece of the wall off and, uh, and, and actually stood with this big piece of, of, of wall. I actually wished uh, it's, uh, it's standing at my, um, at, at my parents' house. Uh, and I wens eindelijk, ek kon het nou gebring het vir, vir vandag uh, om vir julle te wees, uh, this big piece. But there's a photo of uh, him and I standing there. And uh, yeah, we, uh, and, and then from that time, um, I think 
I was I was destined uh, to to stand in a historian's shoes. Um, we were I was about six years old when my uh, my father was driving us from uh, through Belgium, actually through France and Belgium, and uh, I. Uh, we were driving at night. I remember this story vividly. Um, we were driving, and uh, he looked to the left, and my uh, my mother and my and my brother was sleeping. And uh, my father looked over and he told me, uh, "To the left is Dunkirk, and Dunkirk is where the British uh, soldiers." were running away from the German from the German soldiers during World War Two, yeah, yeah, <laughs> and they were they were running um, so much that they got that uh, the German soldiers um, told my dad uh, that uh, that they only had uh, bums for targets uh, when 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 they were running away. Now you might ask, how did my dad come to hear uh, uh, from German soldiers? And this is also, I think, what influenced me uh, to look at history from from two sides, or at least two sides. Um, my my father grew up uh, in South Africa, but his uh, parents, my grandparents, um, lived in in Germany. Just after the war, they um, they went over. My my grandfather was a diplomat there, uh, and then later started a church. But that's a long story. And uh, what happened was um, my, my father came over and he grew up uh, in, in Germany for a long time and saw uh, all these mana uh, that were hanging around uh, with, my, with my grandfather. One of them was a chauffeur and he um, served in the Waffen SS um, during World War II. And then... Uh, another one was uh, a, a, a very close friend of my grandfather's who was actually a, an architect. Now, his name was Um Schnitzlein. And Um Schnitzlein um, was the architect who actually designed the, uh, um, the stadium for the 1972 Munich Olympics. Um, now, his, his story is absolutely fascinating because he turned out to be one of the special forces guys who rescued Mussolini. Um, for those of you who remember the the raid that um, that that actually went in, uh, ordered directly from Hitler, and then that uh, daring commander called Otto Skorzeny, six foot six frame, I think of his, who came in with a bunch of paratroopers, rescued Mussolini without a shot. Uh, um, Schnitzlein was one of the guys who actually went in with the gliders. They, they glided in and it was made from balsam wood and they actually kicked the balsam wood out, went in um, and, and rescued Mussolini without firing a shot. Then they had to design a, or construct uh, an, uh, a runway uh, for the little, um, I, I think it was a... Um, uh, it was a little uh, Fokker, uh, sorry, that, <laughs> but that's really the name of the of the airplane. A little Fokker plane to to come and land there, a little two seater, um, and then they managed to get Mussolini in uh, and fly him out. And with Otto, famously, Otto Skorzeny tried to force himself in there too, and he did. And they looked anxiously as the plane disappeared over the cliff. And then, yeah, and then went up again um, uh, over the, uh, the Apennines. Now, I didn't know that it was the Apennines at that point. My, my father listened to this story, and it, it, it sounded to him as if it was the Alps. Um, because at, for, for an impressionable 10-year-old uh, living in Germany uh, for a time, I think every mountain uh, that is described is the Alps. Um, it turns out it was the Apennine Mountains in, in Italy, in central Italy. Um, and the reason why I know that is because years later, my father told me the story and we were planning um, a trip to, to Italy. And um, my parents told me, uh, as a brief, kiss, for ons. 
Jy gaan ons, ons tour guide wees. I was still at school. And um, I said, I want to find out where Mussolini was rescued. I This story is sticking with me. This this sounds like such a daring and audacious mission. I want to I'm, I want to walk in the footsteps where where it happened. And uh, lo and behold, I read uh, through various uh, books uh, to see, and um, I still thought it was in, in in the German Alps. So then you know we just go over the the Tyrol, and then we you know we can from uh, Italy we can go over. And I read and I looked and I said, no, but this is right in the spine of, of Italy, right in the middle. And we can, we can do it. If we're planning a road trip um, throughout Italy and coming, we, we uh, thought we we're going to go down to Sicily. We can drive up the spine of, of Italy, uh, up the brute, and then um, make our way up to the Alps. And we still didn't know. Uh, if this place existed when we landed in Rome, I just had the picture in my in my mind's eye, and we did the whole tour and we went up, and um, we came uh, up. We were asking for for guys. It's a very isolated area too, so we were <laughs> we were asking uh, uh, sheep herders, um, you know, if, if they knew of this place. So I was I was just saying uh, we we're just asking where Mussolini was kept. Mussolini. And they somehow miraculously they knew what we were talking about, and they kept us. They kept pointing to us to go on this little little road, and uh, we were we were thinking, yes, where are we going? Because the sun is setting now. And as we we went up this mountain, and we got to the end of the road of the mountain, and my parents were a little bit anxious because it was the end of the road, and it was the sun was going down. We didn't know where we were going to be. But I saw as we came over the crest of uh, to the to the uh, peak of the mountain, I saw the the building, and then I knew. Then history came alive for me. I I immediately knew that that what I saw in the book was right here in front of me. I could go out and touch it, and I uh, I, I excitedly told told my parents and. Yeah, uh, as I said, since then the the bug bit. Uh, I saw the the runway which they constructed. You know, we put the photos together. Um, my father had a little tear in his eye because now for the first time he also saw. And um, I, yeah, I mean, um, since then I I could the history bug had had, had bitten me. But as I as I say, it took years for for me to to have it, but. Um, my exposure, I think my father, uh, my pa, was the, uh, was the greatest influence on me um, to be an historian. Um, he himself, he was, a, um, he was actually uh, in, he did his Dienstplug in, uh, he was, uh, I think, 1979 in name, uh, 78 or 79, and he was a rechts officer um, op Tempe, a military basis, uh, Bloemfontein. And um, I, I, you can also tell lots of stories from his, from his die. I think by a funny manner, so work, uh, 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 met him, uh, on Kwang Fint, uh, where he died with, uh, um, in, yeah, basis in, in all I think, uh, my, so I, I was, Say say by now was Sivi, uh, when the, I wherever he could get uh, uh, his his time to to grow his hair, he would. Um, uh, yeah, I I I I had my say say dinge gehad daarso in die in die army say uh, trials and tribulations. Maar uh, yeah, there was there was goeie da harde da. Um, what I what I say I I saw all that say for. Uh, my my broer, uh, jylle, ek wens jylle kon een bykie dienstplug ook beleef het, uh, net so dat jylle kan weet, weet, uh, weet wat, uh, wat het is om, om rechtig man te wees. Um, jy, jy, kan, jy kan al die ander goed beleef, maar om twee jaar uh, in, die, in, in die Weermacht te wees, 
uh, completely alone, but surrounded by by brothers uh, that you will that you will know for life and remember for life uh, because you you went through the hard things together. You went through you had the harder uh, off job, and um, yeah. Uh, since then, that is why I've got this. I think it's no surprise that my interest in South African military history uh, grew from there. Um, just a, a matter, uh, an aside. I was actually never, uh, I was never completely uh, convinced to become a, an historian from the start, because I thought that uh, an historian is uh, basically uh, will be the black sheep of any family, because you you earn nothing when you when you're an historian. Um, so I actually studied law for for a while as well. Um, and uh, yeah, of uh, course, and I have got that in common as well, just like our love for history. So there's another thing. And then after that, I um, I just couldn't uh, get into the law. I, the, the 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 yearning for, for for history. I think when something's your passion, uh, it pulls you from even the strongest indication that you have to earn a living. And um, uh, fortunately enough, my passion uh, is is also earning me a living at this current moment. Um, so I'm I'm very fortunate there. And uh, yeah, and then I when I uh, when I did my 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 masters, um, I, I I went to Rhodes University uh, in Grahamstown and uh, did uh, my masters as well as my PhD there. Um, under brilliant supervision, I'd, I'd rather not, uh, for the sake of, of this, I'd, I'd rather not uh, name, name him, but he was an absolute star of a supervisor. Uh, I owe him everything uh, because he also taught me um, balance. Balance is key when you, when you look at, at history. Um, you, you, you look at the facts and you look at what the facts mean um, but at the same time, you also look at weighing up um, the probabilities. Also, something from from law <laughs> that that I also took over, weighing up the probabilities uh, of what it means, uh, of what the the facts uh, mean or could possibly mean. Um, and then from from there, um, yeah, my 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 masters uh, was all about. Um, a, a small community uh, near where uh, where I used to live. Um, of course, says that I'm uh, uh, says I'm from the Eastern Cape because I left at Westkap and all. Want ek het Westkap sy geskiedenis gedoen. Van die weste tot die oorste, van die noorde tot die seide. That's my niche. Um, I've I did my MA on a clearing uh, gemeenskap, uh, which is close by to where I live. Um, and looking at how they used the kerk, uh, the NGO gemeenskap, how they used the church um, to define their identity on the land which they which they live. I think that was also a um, a fascinating story because uh, the the story there is that this community saw themselves as a um, as God's people, God's chosen people, um, because they were placed in this fertile, uh, um, very rich soil area on what we locals call the Golden Mile uh, between Busman Srafir Mont and uh, Cannon Rocks or uh, Bokness, um, actually further, Alexandria. And that, that stretch... Um, is owned by some of the wealthiest dairy farmers, uh, if not in the province, if uh, if not in South Africa. And um, these, uh, this community found themselves uh, there. And during apartheid, they couldn't be moved, and no one really understood why. And um, I did a bit of digging, and found out this incredible story of of love, actually. Um, a love story between a trekboer and a, um, a, a colored lady 
uh, called Sada Plaikis. And the, the track boer's name was Um Dirk Janse van Rensburg. Um, he was a track boer living, uh, possibly born in the early 1800s. Um, and uh, the, the probability, again, probability, is that they actually met um, somewhere in Cape Town, um, which maybe makes it uh, possible that Sara could have been a, an emancipated slave uh, or a, a, a koi or ku um, servant. And they went, uh, the, the historical records show that they moved east. Um, moved east for what? Uh, but they, they, they moved east to the eastern frontier. At that time, uh, Busman Sophie was very close to, to the Fish River, or well, still is close to the Fish but the, the border, the, the eastern frontier um, was the Fish River at that point. So the, the, the eastern border of the, of the um, uh, Cape Colony was, was the Fish River, and uh, Busman Sophie is about uh, 120 kilometers, no, not even, it would be 80 kilometers from the Fish River. So um, they went very far, um, and we don't really know why, why they went that far, but um, Dirk then became a foreman on, on a farm called Klipfontein to a white man, uh, um, Skeper, who was farming there. And um, it, uh, according to the, to the wills and testament of um, Skeper, he was so moved by the service of Um Dirk and uh, of Sir Sara, who looked after uh, um, uh, Opa Skippers, that he actually um, sold him half of his farm for actually a pittance. Um, and that half became uh, Dirk's, after, he worked it for years uh, selling uh, eggs and goats um, at the market. And eventually, he had enough uh, coin to 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 um, purchase it um, uh, fully. Uh, it went into uh, his his deed uh, ten years after after purchase. And um, they what happened then was, Sarah and Dirk were getting very um, uh, old in the tooth and long in the tooth, may I say, and they had five children. At that time, and uh, it was at the, it was coming to the uh, late 1800s, and they could actually see somehow they had a very good lawyer um, at Dolden Stone in Grahamstown, who uh, saw that there are changing winds uh, coming in South Africa. Segregation was starting to take uh, quite a hold in the Cape Colony, and um, he advised them to set up a will and testament which would put the, the, the land upon the, the death of, uh, of one of the spouses, the first spouse, um, the, the land will devolve into a trust, which means that the trust then will, uh, will keep the land in the, the, the family will be able to stay on the land in perpetuity. In ad, as the as the legalese ad infinitum, um, so forever. And now th that's fascinating on its own, but uh, a more fascinating point is that there was the inclusion in in the will of a so-called asylum clause. Um, now you might ask, what what does asylum clause mean? The asylum clause meant that uh, not only can the descendants of Dirk and Sara stay on the land, but also their family. So the, the, the interpretation was so broad um, on it that it actually meant that any person that was related, that was, that was remotely related to the Van Rensburg could actually come and stay on, on, on the land, Kripfontein, which actually meant that it was um, that was a Asa, for 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 the mensen van van Kipfontein, ach, for, for die mensen rondom 
om daar te kom bly, as jy kon bewys dat jy familie dit was, van die, van, van die mense, kon jy eindelijk daar gaan, gaan, gaan bly, um, en jy, jy was nie een vrug gebruik nie, uh, maar daar was, it was a usufruct, it was a usufruct, so the, the, the five um, uh, siblings and their descendants then became the usufructuaries of, of the land, so they had uses uh, over the land, um, Madan, uh, they could use their, uh, they could invite their families uh, to come and stay on, on it. That to me was uh, was such a, a beautiful story, and all, but also a completely um, marginalized one. Uh, no one actually, even the people of Kupfontein didn't even know of, of that story. Um, they thought that they had been uh, they are the descendants of uh, a soldier, perhaps, who's, who had this land bequeathed to him by the Queen of England. Um, that's actually how I started. That, that was my approach to the, to the research, because that was the story that went around the area for so long. And so um, that, it's a fundamental, I think it's a fundamental element of a historian um, to keep his mind or his or, or her mind open um, to any sort of possibility that, that that could happen because what you might think is what happened is not necessarily so and you can have you'll have your your um, co- the, the the rug will be pulled from under your f- feet time and time again uh, your bias will be questioned over and over again and it's happened to me numerous times where I come in with with a, a certain preconceived idea of what it must be, of what this narrative is. Got I've got the narrative in my head, and then my mind is changed, um, absolutely. And then I have to then uh, my mind is changed because I've been convinced by the facts. You look at the facts, and they the 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 fight of the ball, the narrative, this 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 word um, and uh, that's why I uh, what what Kurs said about history uh, informing the future uh, is very very important because um, we we always fall into the trap of bias for one thing, and we always fall into the trap of repetition. Um, the, the, the age-old adage that uh, history repeats itself, it, it's a cliche, but it's a cliche for a reason, because we don't learn. Um, and that's why for me, history, and, and for course, and I, and I hope that for many of, of, of you out there, um, history is uh, such a valuable lesson. Um, Currently, I so I I, I I went on did my PhD, um, and my PhD is on land reform, on a small village. Uh, I focus on a small hamlet called Salem, um, between Grahamstown and uh, Kenton on Sea, um, and Salem is gebouwd on a groot grond hervormings project of a a claim. Uh, that went on there, um, started 25 years ago, and it's still yet to be really concluded. Um, in Salem, for the man who in the West Coast of Soviet, Salem is a uh, cricket ground, is the oldest cricket ground uh, of cricket club, so I say, um, in the West Coast in Dini, South Africa, which might pose the question of how can this land be under claim uh, if, if the, the cricket club is older than 1913 um, because the, that's as, as per the, the, the land claim uh, one of the requirements is that uh, the, the community must have been dispossessed uh, on the 21st of June 1913 or after um, that's when the, the abhorrent land act came into effect and um, the, the, the answer is that 
it's not the 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 club is not included in the claim but it's on what is called a commons a common edge where um a, a gemeente grond or meent grond where um uh, african uh, pastoralists uh, use the, the the land along with white farmers the settlers het daar gekom in 1820 het die uh, die mense um, uh, nie verdrijf nie, want dit was al klaar gedoen in 1812, so acht jaar voor die settlers gekom het, was, daar, uh, was die kosse uh, verdrijf, maar toe het hulle gekom uh, in een reeks oorlo, um, wat vandag genoem word, the frontier wars, or um, more socialist historians call them the wars of dispossession, um, die um, die conflict het aangegaan tot 1879, so goeie uh, 100 jaar van oorlog uh, om die uh, frontiergebied um, jy weet te, te, te behou en so uh, the, the frontier is in its nature is a, a contested zone um, and no real political force has any sort of control over it En die ongeluk is dat die settlers was in die middel van die oorlogszone geplaas dier hulle eie regering um, om daar te, te wees als een buffer um, tussen die, die trosse dreigement en die kolonie. Um, and uh, once the, the settlers established themselves as, as farmers um, there was an economy in the eastern frontier and uh, labor was also sought for on those farms. And so a there was an unlimited supply of, of labor from across the Fish River. Um, and because of the the wars that had battered and decimated the, the, the Kosa people uh, for so long, um, a lot of them had no food on the table whatsoever. Um, the territory had shrunk to such an extent that their whole way of life, uh, the pastoralist way of life in Kosa land, uh, or what is uh, now known as, as uh, the trans the, the Siskai and further the Transkai, um, that area was completely ravaged by, by famine as a result of all these groups uh, trying to live on one another um, and live on top of each other. And so a lot of them were forced to come back across the fish and look for work on the farms. Um, and then some of them kind of sapled, uh, terug gesapled met hulle beeste om, om te kyk en toe het hulle maar net geblei in die kolonie. En so het het, het, het aangegaan vir jare. And then in 1940, um, a court order was sought by some of the farmers who wanted to subdivide the, the common edge, the meant grond, into private um, property. Now, the problem was that was that there were uh, uh, closer people living there on, on the common edge because they had come back. The argument was that they were laborers, so they they would go wherever their, their masters would go. Uh, so as he didn't. Um, but in in that case, in this case, uh, not all of them were laborers. Some of them, as it was found in, in historical uh, evidence, uh, some of them were actually um, independent, independent farmers. Um, and what happened was that they were evicted uh, to make way for the subdivision of, of the land. Um, and this was seen by the court of quo, uh, the the land um, the land claims court the LCC as a discriminatory uh, act or um, a piece of legislation so that's one, that's also another requirement of uh, of of a of a land claim is that the the community or individual must be dispossessed. Uh, after 1913, as a result of a discriminatory law or practice. Um, and these people were not consulted uh, by, by any legal entity or the, the farmers themselves. 
So this constitutes, uh, in accordance with the, the Land Restitution Act, as a discriminatory practice. Um, and the court, a quo, found this to be so as well. The landowners um, took it to the to the Supreme Court of Appeal. Uh, they lost the, the 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 appeal. They took it to the Constitutional Court, and there was a brilliant judgment uh, by uh, a certain judge. I think I can name him here, um, Judge Cameron, Edwin Cameron, uh, probably one of our most excellent um, uh, legal heads uh, in South Africa, uh, in, in contemporaries in South Africa, post-94 South Africa, a very balanced, uh, um, sober judgment, no emotion, no, well, no real emotion, but an empathy for both sides. Um, yeah, of course, you saw that I need to ensure judgment to excel work for, you, for your honesty. I think it's a it's a very good um, explanation um, of how the land claims process works, as well as how um, how this um, particular claim works. Because it uh, you know commonage it's a very complex issue, um, and uh, I was fortunate enough to to be involved in the constitutional court's um, research. Uh, where they asked me to, to to do research on because I was actually busy finishing up with my with my PhD with that, and they actually asked me to to be involved to to look at the evidence. So you know, go to the archives to see if I couldn't find any more evidence um, to to help the court uh, with its its judgment. Um, it was an incredible opportunity, and I think also. Uh, it's one of the reasons why I absolutely tell people, especially young kids, if you guys are going to, if you're not unsure, if you're unsure on your future, on what you need to do, study history. I know it's a contradiction of terms. You're looking, you know, uh, looking to your future, study the past, but it opens doors that you don't even know existed. Um, I, uh, I always thought I was going to go into a legal direction. I never knew it was going to be this way, um, but it, it 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 turned out it was uh, it was the best decision I I ever made uh, to do it. And um, yeah, I'm 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 really happy, and that is why, like Chris said right at the beginning. I know this is very long now, but uh, uh, right at the beginning, Chris uh, said that I've I've got a channel. The reason why I started uh, this channel. The historian stash was to um, to to show um, not just the harde barde van ons, the old manner, but also um, young people uh, how fun history can be, and also hidden gems, stories that that relate to us. Um, I, uh, you know, one of my episodes that I that I did then that I did. Was of a a a, a old retired um, um, land surveyor who from uh, Harnitz, Einitzberg in Limpopo, who became a duke, the Duke of Athol, uh, and he didn't ask for it. He had to become it uh, because it was part of the bloodline. He he was it, uh, and this. Uh, old Topi from from Einitzberg, Limpopo, uh, North Transvaal, became became a, a duke in Scotland, and uh, he every year he would go over and uh, attend to 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 the troops. The interesting thing about the the Duke of Athol is he's the only duke in the entire um, nobility, not just of Scotland but also of England, who has a private army. And who is entitled to have a private army? Um, these guys, it's I think they only number about uh, just over a hundred, but they <laughs> they are able to um, to you know to operate as an independent force, um, and 
uh, on instruction of only the Duke. The Duke is commander in chief of of these of this group of guys. Absolutely fascinating story. Again, it came from one of uh, I heard of this story as a result of uh, my parents went to go visit Scotland. My dad con- called me very excitedly to say, "Yes, you'll never you'll never realize what we came and saw here. You won't believe it." Um, and uh, that gripped me, and I thought, "No, yes, this has to be an episode. I I need to shed light on uh, on this so that people can know back in South Africa." Um, you know what what our people are doing uh, all over the place and i think it's quite a funny one too it makes me think of the old uh, afrikaans movie called lord wimpit um i i read of your own mana that's all doni uh because the the reluctant uh wimpit is also concoct uh, coerced into doing it and um i i think i was not for the national party and now even skill with any supper work by makaka it was a whole thing and uh, but this this um uh duke was also very reluctant to to go over until he heard that uh the only way to get out of it is either to die or renounce it and then you go to prison um and yeah it uh, <laughs> very interesting and i urge you uh you guys to uh to go and check it out but there's many of those stories and um over also i um uh i came across you know a lots of stories to do with um south african military uh and police um there's two episodes dedicated to the so called fox street siege um that uh i mean also also in itself quite an absurd uh event in in South African military and police history was quite a close call um that again you know it, it evokes quite a lot of feelings i think uh, among veterans especially because of the participant that the hostage taker and his nature but we won't go into that um and yeah uh all different kinds of um histories taken from a balanced point of view um that I that I wish to shed light on next year I propose I'm, I'm proposing to um focus on the high school syllabus of um uh of of South African history um so that I can actually help um school kids who are struggling with uh you know how to how to learn history because for me it was also very hard at school uh the subject history to me was actually in all honesty quite quite boring um you know the way it was taught the way it was it 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 was uh, approached to me it was it was quite quite boring so i i i want to offer an alternative um for for kids because uh a lot of my friends were put off because of that you know they went into other directions and chose something which i think is boring like accounting <laughs> but uh um you know th- it's just the way of the beast and and, that, and that's why i want to um try and 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 keep uh kids enthusiastic about history because it is absolutely vital it's important that we uh that we that we know our history and that we also know how to interrogate and critique history that we know how how to critically approach what is what is fed to us what is what is um what what we are told uh because a lot of it is if not all it is uh, uh, politicized um history is always the 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 victim of of politics and political rhetoric um van albe kanter it it comes from from multiple sides you know the nationalists that it back then the anc are doing it now the eff love doing it all the time and i want to i want to just say there is another option of just listening and of uh, soberly and critically looking at at the past um and analyzing the facts 
and yeah, num num for me a fair links or a fair rechts or whatever you level. I, 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 that that for me is not important to me. Uh, what is important to me is, and I think to 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 men like Kuss and um, you know many of us, uh, it, it's important for us to preserve, and and that's why I I really love the channel uh, um, legacy. Uh, the name says it all. Um, to to keep the legacy of uh, of of men, great men, um, who who participated sometimes unwillingly, reluctantly, um, and did great things, uh, you know, in in their capacity, um, did the best they could, and mana and frower, men and women, did the best they could um, for for their country and for themselves. And sometimes for each other, uh, actually all, all the time for each other, a band of brothers and sisters. Um, and that to me is, it's, it's something to, to, to behold. It's something to, um, to, to cherish. Um, and that's why I, yeah, um, I'm, I'm trying to do something similar, uh, but some, a bit more lighthearted. Um, and yeah, I'm moedig jylle allemaal on, as you net a lighthearted channel that is now in the English, uh, that I can now do. <laughs> but um, I, I invite you all to, to come and join the story and stash. And um, yeah, if you've got kids or know of kids, please tell them uh, this is the place where, where you'll learn proper history. So, um, of course, bye, Donkey Variants. Uh, thank you so much. And uh, yeah, fight, fight. My story is eight. I was listening to this and I was enjoying myself so much. Well, I thank you for this. I'm going to tell you a story. I actually wrote a book on it. Some, some time ago, somebody approached me. Let, let's call her my handler. And she was a dreadful woman. Actually, she was a very wonderful person, but you had to be on the right side. Well, God will not have mercy on you, that I can tell you. And she came out and she says to me, Chris, we've got a problem in counter-terrorism. I said, I'm listening. And she says, uh, they're not being rescued. The hostages are not being rescued alive anymore. In fact, since 2012 till today, the Americans, who I don't write highly as a military, anybody who's on, who's on uh, legacy will know I hold them of utter contempt, actually. Um, they succeeded once in Africa and sub saharan Africa to rescue somebody alive. The rest of the time, people just died. Same with the Brits. They're really not as good. And the problem they're not as good is, is because the terrorism has evolved as well. And so it was very interesting for me to see how things went from year to year to year, and there's counter strikes, counter, counter, and then you think something new and blah, blah, blah. So the problem was is how to approach a hostage nest. Let us say you have a scenario with a compound or something like you would find in the Middle East, even in Africa. You have hostages there, you've got the hostage takers, and these people, of course, are a bunch of desperados, and terrorism is involved. So you might say they're even trained, somehow trained, not very well, but they are trained. And let's say they now need to be rescued, these hostages. Now, there's a couple of interesting things, and now we're getting back to Eastern. The FBI statistics will tell you that within three days, three days, 29% of those hostages will turn. And they will start suffering from a Stockholm syndrome. Mm -hmm. So what happens is during training, we would explain to people that you cannot trust these guys who are sitting next to you. That's the other weird thing about African hostages in Sub-Saharan Africa is that we are helping groups. We are not helping... Uh, solitarily like you would find in Italy and other places they hold in groups. So you cannot trust these people. And the question then arose, so what can you do? So we started looking at history. How can you approach this place without them knowing you then? Because you need the advantage of surprise. If I can get a special forces team right inside that hostage place, I'm going to win. There's only going to be two solutions here, outcomes. They're going to die, <clears throat> and we're going to rescue them. 
We might take a few uh, casualties, it happens, but I guarantee you once you go in that, uh, that situation, uh, there's no turning back. There's no such thing as battle. Okay, stormy, mm -hmm. run away again. I mean, it's not going to happen. Not in Africa. So we looked at the existing techniques. The first one is, which everybody knows, you come with a helicopter, guys are standing on the side, the helicopter flares, fast rope down or abseil down, fast rope is preferred, right on top of it, in you go, where you go. Won't work. Because if these guys have helicopters approaching, they kill the hostages. Not to say we cannot take revenge afterwards. We can always uh -huh. pull them out as well, which of course we will, because you don't want to waste the board's time over rubbish. You know, just make sure that, you know, dead men tell no lies in that world. Now, the second way of doing it is what the Americans started trying to do in uh, in Iraq and Afghanistan. They realized coming in with helicopters doesn't work. Even if I cover it by flying multiple, multiple helicopters around for days, these guys actually do know. So they would drop him off about between 15 to 25 kilos from the target, then they walk in. So the terrorists got wise to that as well. And here you see again history in motion. They got guys out of their cell phones reporting in. Okay, so now let us block their transmissions. Ah, now I don't hear anything because they're not calling in. I kill the hostages. Uh, then the only way thing you can do is, and we did train that, is you parachute, you free fall right down onto that nest. Your damn problem is, unless you're covered by snipers surrounding it, that the time you take to get out of your harness is a minute or two. But you might, of course, fall yourself to work also there. So it's not that great idea, especially not at night, but it can be done. But we did look at it. And then there's another way, which is last week, my friend, Pine Pinar, of the reaction force in in Durban actually explained to us, he took a Casper and he drove right into that house. He banged that place open and then they came out like squirrels here over the Casper and they stormed that house. It takes a special kind of, 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 of guts to do that, I can tell you. Yeah. So I said to myself, Yaku, and I think you will love us. I said to myself in history, let us look at Fort Eban Yamal in Team Fiat. Mm. Mm. Let us look at the Mussolini race here. Let us look at the attack on Tito, Marshal Tito. Let us look at D-Day. Guys, what all these things I've just said to you have in common is gliders. But the last glider which was used to oper operationally was in the Soviet Union in about 1965. And we know it about in the year 2008 just before I left. And uh, I said to myself, why don't we use gliders in counterterrorism? Uh. And everybody said, he's more. Just on uh. I said, but listen to me. Historically, it was done. This attack on Mussolini, this rescue was a special forces operation. This attack on Tito, this attack on Ivan Namal, which opened the, 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 the gate for uh, the armor frost in 1940, the first blitzkrieg. That was special forces. And I knew this because I studied history. And anyway, so it was a who and a how, and I said, okay, look, I'll tell you one thing. Let's look at statistics. If I can get hold of one of these big gliders, I can note about the platoon of special forces people in it, say about 25 men, say 50 men. And I will land with that thing right on top of this, onto this target. I can do that. All I need to do is I need a few snipers to cover the guards, to take them out. I need to come in at night. I'm silent. I cannot be picked up on my radar because it is composites. And there's no noise. There's no noise. If you have night vision and you're very vigilant and you start looking around, yeah, you will pick it up. We tested it. So you can come in, you can see a slight glow of the air coming over the wheel. It creates it. You can see it. But the chances of this being seen is not good. And then we had two problems remaining. How do you get quickly quickly enough out of that glider? So we thought of blowing the doors. We did to a plastic explosive, blowing the doors open, or just remove the damn doors. But that made noise. So we had to test it. Then there was a, another problem. 
And that was how to stop that glider quickly enough because the original gliders didn't actually have brakes. It just ran itself and then it, it stopped. But I had to find out by studying history once again that most of those gliders were actually recovered. And they recovered them by putting the wounded men inside them. Then they wrecked it like a rugby post, like a rugby pilot. And then comes the Dakota with a hook and he grabs this thing. And then he pulls the hell out of it and then he takes off. So we could recover it, so we could keep the secrecy. And so uh, it was decided to test this thing. And the problem we had is we just couldn't get that glider to stop quickly enough, even with ABS brakes, because that adds weight. And then I looked at another operation which happened when the Americans tried to rescue the Iranian hostages in 1980. That was Operational Eagle Claw. It's also in one of my books. And let me say they did the perfect poor job. But they did learn from it. They did learn from it. And, and that's important. But one of the plans they had, had was to actually land C-130 Hercules aircraft. That's a four-motor um, military cargo lifter. They wanted to land this thing right inside the stadium, like a football stadium. And of course, people say you must be few F words we <laughs> use. <laughs> yeah. I, I could prove that they actually could have done it because what they did is they took uh, rockets and they placed them forward. And so what happens is the thing comes in, the rocket goes off, it pushes back, it's yeah. it and this thing just plums down. You can go on the internet, you will find the test videos where they did that. Of course, I wrote off uh, Aquilus because of being caught a fire, all sorts of things happened. Mm. And the, you can see the pilots running, still think they're running today still. They were running out of <laughs> it burned out completely, but it could be done. Sure. So I said, okay, so why don't we take these rockets, put them inside the pipe so that the flame doesn't go out and burn the um, glider out, and that's mm. it. And I can tell you, those pilots, and she was actually one of them, as handler, she put that thing down, probably two tennis courts, not more. And then we perfected this idea so much that we could use gliders in modern counterterrorism. Wow. And I thought to myself, man, we did the great. And NATO and the West were not interested. They just couldn't bother because they come with their helicopters. They don't care where the people live yeah. or not. So I guess mm -hmm. we stole the idea. The Chinese. And now the Chinese mm. army can load 60 of their people into one of these things simply because they're smaller than us. So they can put, uh, it, it's incredible. I, I wrote it in the book, Kate and Angelique, where I explained the entire story, how it happens. But what struck me is when you started talking about Mussolini, is how history can be used to assist today. And, and that for me is the important part. Now, yeah. I'm glad you mentioned to me also that uh, politics and history, because that is something which many legacy viewers are bitterly complaining about. They feel that their children are not learning the truth, or if they learn the truth, it's a bit askew. Now, we know it's like that. If, if you write anything in life, a book, whatever, you do put your own things in. I mean, <laughs> you, yeah. you, you, yeah. I, I would definitely say that. I would always write from a Christian viewpoint, and, and that's yeah. my... Now, Winston Churchill, I don't like Winston Churchill. I think he was a bloody occultist and uh, not nearly as good as people think he is and blah, blah, blah. Take like for Mickey out of English a bit. Yeah. Um, mm. He said, he actually said, history will be very kind to me because I, Winston, intends writing it. And of course, mm. the man was such a fantastic author. I mean, if you read his mm. books, oh. he just opens up. Just fantastic. But you can't really trust his books that much because, because of that. Now, mm. how would you say the polit politics in, in the politics and history of what our children are learning? Is that a good thing or a bad thing, or, or should we just live with it and try to rectify if there's anything to rectify? You know, Chris, yes, I, um, just firstly, uh, the, the stories that you told are oh, wild. Uh, it's absolutely incredible to, to listen to this firsthand. Um, the uh, you know you mentioning the skyhook it's something that I uh, that I also learned about uh, uh, I think the the Americans tried to use that um, in in Vietnam 
as well um, in, a, in a far more um, wider sense to pick up an individual uh, person who's you know, behind enemy lines and all he does is just he lets a parachute uh, up with a flare and you know, bounce your hook, the hook is attached and then a C-130 comes in. Yeah, absolutely um, incredible. The, the, the resourcefulness and you saying that you, you, know, you, you uh, use history as, a, as an inspiration on how to get guys out. Absolutely. And, you know, the, the Israelis used uh, a Trojan horse uh, in, at Entebbe, you know, um, taking Idi Amin. I mean, I think that was ingenious. Uh, Idi Amin's car, um, Fatrawa, uh, a Mercedes, but not just any Mercedes. They had to get, uh, yes, my, my, my father keeps on telling me exactly the, the, the right one. I can't remember the name. But it's a very special um, uh, Mercedes, as these African dictators seem to get. You know, they, it's always the best of the best. Um, and going in, and these guys, you know, all the um, uh, uh, Ugandan soldiers standing to uh, as as these uh, IDF mana are, are driving past them. You know, things like that. Um, history can be an inspiration. Uh, it's the, the practical effect of it. Uh, you, you can't just ignore history um, and, and you can't ignore past events uh, just because it suits your narrative. And I think that's what, uh, what many, many people, um, not just politicians, but many people uh, do that where, you know, there's a the trap and struck from ignorance um, you had, uh, uh, to to not know uh, is better than knowing because it suits my truth, and that is stupid. Um, sorry, but it it, it is. Um, I I I always think that um, children, uh, sc school children, um, are the future, but are the future of us, and take that literally because. Uh, the future can mean many things. The future can mean prosperity, or or it can mean um, despair. How how would you want your children to 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 be the future? You know how how do you want them to 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 grow up? Do you want them to become um, uh, masters of the universe? You know, but but in a responsible way that they work together to make this world better than the way that you left it, or do you want them uh, to fall into the same traps as maybe your fathers and mothers uh, did when when World War Two broke out? You know, to go through uh, that horror. Um, and the thing is, we 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 talk about. I mean. Unfortunately, as a, as, as a South African historian, I sometimes feel that I don't have a lot of scope. I don't have a lot of influence because we here at the southern tip of Africa, right at the bottom, we don't really have uh, a, a lot of influence of what's going on around us in you know, the biggest states of America, um, you know, the NATO countries, China uh, and Russia. But what we do uh, have is um, we have insight that is unique um, and we've got the potential to become the light, um, the, the enlightened of, of, of the world. But because uh, our, our government seems to, um, you know, put itself in this whole alliance politics, uh, you know, type of trend, um, that's taking that's highly limiting uh, South Africa uh, as, as a country. But that doesn't stop us as individuals from sifting through the BS that what of what the government is trying to feed us. I, I think that I was I was actually looking at the at the um, curriculum, uh, the high school curriculum because you ask uh, you know whether it's a good thing or a bad thing that politics is, is mixed. And um, what I see is that um, this, the, the curriculum 
is very very much it it it, it isn't uh, overtly um, indoctrin indoctrination, but it can be uh, uh, it, it it can indoctrinate children. Um, but just like if you, I think if you take the the old history books of uh, you know nineteen. Uh, 62 or 1963 those books are also uh, extremely in, uh, indoctrinating if you uh, I, I I always do the whole thing I mean you know you 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 look at the Bible where uh, Jesus says you know um, um, you know uh, be kind to yourself uh, be kind to your neighbor as you would be to yourself um, and uh, that you know walk a mile in another man's shoes. As ek a swartman was in 1963, en ek lees die boek, die geschiedenis, um, jy weet wat, wat aan my uh, gegee is, sal ek de moeren wees. As ek, as ek dit doe, I will, I will feel absolutely angry uh, of, of what I'm reading. So too would an, an Afrikaner reading uh, this curricula, as I, I mean, I must admit, I was mildly uh, um, Quite, you know, I was I was a big fan when I when I read about how um, you know Afrikaners are are, are seen, especially uh, in in the South African War. Um, you know the, what how they want the children to be taught about the South African War, um, and you know, and that there's a lot more emphasis needs to be put on this and that and this. Um, so. For me, uh, you know, it, it's it's vital that uh, we we keep we are cognizant of 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 the politics. Well, and and uh, uh, I think politics uh, should be a good thing because um, it it gives us a a, um, a common <laughs> a common antagonist. I think uh, for for not just teachers, but also for children, to critically engage in the material, to say that, I think I know what's going on here. I know, I think I know, um, you know, what, what they're trying to, to, to do here with, with, with the curriculum. I think I know what they're trying to, um, you know, to teach us. Um, but I'm not going to necessarily believe uh, you know, uh, or or necessarily go into that trend, into that. I can't even die straight up. Um, to wait, you know, what the what the what my onderwijzers may gaan gaan weer oor uh Sharpville nie for for example. You know, um, Sharpville was another one, that quite a contentious thing in the curriculum that it was basically just a you know a, a massacre that was initiated by by South African police. Variants. Come and check now all the kante. I mean, um, kids are just going to see that and and see that all white Afrikaner males were antagonistic. Uh, so, uh, um, wie was it? Uh, uh, well, I mean, Pierre Pierre Bruta. It 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 was uh, I, I I'm always taken to to humor when when all these things happen and uh, in. In a in a movie called Oshak um, uh, Shuster, uh, I think it, it was the boxer. Of course, as you may can help, Adilem, I think, uh, was his name. Uh, uh, Knutze. Yeah, Knutze. Uh, 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 is it? Yeah. Uh, well, he, uh, I think he, he was boxer as well. Harry uh, Harry Knutze, is it? No, is that that's right? what you're talking about. I'll get to his name now. I'll, I'll... Sorry, yeah, yeah. Uh, my, he was um... in the police, he was a court unit member. Court in Rhodesia. Okay. Uh, uh, yeah. um, where, where he, in, in, the, in, the, in the movie, he, he goes and he says, Who the hell would I can now see bow with me? And this is the thing. This is the thing. Who the hell would I can now see bow with me? It's a couple of the uh, where where they ignore nation building uh, in exchange for political points. Um, yes, we need to know uh, our history and how how bad apartheid was. Uh, that 
that there's just like the the German people uh, were forced uh, to know how how bad uh, Nazism was, and to this day, you know, any sort of symbology, uh, Nazi paraphernalia, and so on, is is banned in um, in in um, Germany. But the thing is, is that uh, do we equate the two? Do we equate the two uh, things? Uh, is it is it necessary to equate? But some might say yes, very much so. We feel um, we feel that uh, Nazism equates African nationalism because apartheid was was on the level. It could have been much worse than actually it was. Other people would say, "Ah, man, that was not um, because it was." That they were far more uh, clear and present dangers um, that that informed the 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 African and national ideology. Um, they might believe that some of them were were invented in, during Nazism, whereas uh, during uh, the Cold War, these it was it was necessary for containment and and uh, for for separation. So these types of arguments um, is important, and, and that's why history, um, if if not for nothing else, history should train critical thought, critical thinking. And in the curriculum, it talks about critical thinking and and all that. But the way that again, the way that it is presented makes it seem that it could possibly be indoctrinating. What was what was radical. Uh, 30 years ago, for you know, for uh, for the most school children back then, is tame now. Is it's par for the course now, which means that um, you're not you're not spurring on critical thought for for um, you know black kids in the township who are just being told that uh, their parents were the were, uh, were the heroes and and their white friends. Parents were the villains. Um, that you know th- that doesn't make sense for 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 reconciliation, uh, for any path towards towards reconciliation. Um, so that's what what I try and uh, or that's what I'm trying to combat. Um, where I want to show uh, a balanced line where everyone is included. Um, and where everyone can understand everyone else, that there's there's a a, a, a bridge uh, to be to be built where we can understand why our our uh, forebears acted the way they did. And um, if if I can if I can change one person's mind uh, from becoming one radical and changing him to being a moderate. Um, you know, from either the, the the left or the right, and bring him or her to to a moderate standpoint, then I'll say, "I the yera ka my no Then I've, uh, I've 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 changed someone's mind um, for the better. Yeah, it was Eisenhower who said, "If you don't walk in the middle of a road, you walk in the gutter." So then yeah. that, that was quite a good statement. I think it's Kali Knutu we're talking about. The back from Boxberg of Swedes. That was saying all that. Yeah, the back, that's a yeah. skis. Sorry, uh, if 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 Kali if Kali is out there, Yamar, Yamar that, that we uh, uh, forgot you, uh, but you're still a legend. <laughs> I can tell you a few stories of Kali Knutsa because he was in a dark unit of my former commander, Colonel Potgitter, who was then one of the Potgitter brewers at the flying squad in Pretoria. But uh, let's say Kali lost that fight. That's all I'm going to say. It seems like uh, he <laughs> was clapped on his pet out, <laughs> but he did take it. <laughs> but I know in the police dog school, uh, Kali actually holds the record at the old police dog school for running up there, but they call the reservoir. Now, this flipping place is like right on top of a copy there, and you run with your dog up and down, and the instructors look for binoculars, of course, and you can't do it. Even if you're quite fit and you go quite hard, you can do it in about, I would say, 40 minutes, perhaps 55 minutes if you're really doing it. But this colleague did it in less than 20 minutes. And he did it by picking up his dog. He actually picked up his alsatian in a ran with it. And he ran back. He was that fit. And he was a great, great guy. 
Sure. I think that in TV, I'm glad you mentioned in TV because I mean TV kind of very interesting thing which we still talk about in in uh, in counterterrorism is and and they they split the juice. They took uh, mm. the juice and they put them somewhere else. Of course, there's ways you can see if the guys are Jew or not. You know. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, many Americans as well are like that. Uh, most of them are actually tip. God knows why. Uh, it can cost you your life. I mean, these days we've seen mm. that they actually do lower your pants to see what you are. And yeah. if you can't explain, you might be, be murdered right there on the spot. But this yeah. guy, when they stormed the building, they went in in their best style. It's what it became known as <clears throat> no finesse. They just mm. stormed it and they shot it in Hebrew, lie down, lie down, stay mm. down. And they started shooting where they stood up. And that's how they, 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 they rescued them. But there was a French Jew who couldn't really speak Hebrew that much. And so he got up and they shot him dead. Uh, these I... things, that is what we call the Entebbe uh, principle, uh, which was show you again, here comes the history, guys. You know what? Exactly. This is history. You sit here listening to the special forces guys or to whoever talking. Man, you're experiencing uh, history in its purest form, according to yeah. me. Yeah, you agree? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I, I mean, listening this, this like a, uh, like we were chatting about the, uh, I, I, I listened and I watched a couple of your episodes, and I thought, yes, man, this is a privilege to for for you to. Uh, I think you also uh, you will agree that it's an absolute privilege to have these men tell their story on your channel. Um, you know, and and them volunteering to do so. I, I know that the uh, space mark mana, um, they're an absolute. They're a they're a force. Um, they're a. I think it's it's a different breed. You know, uh, of of man that that decides to do, uh, the things they do. Um, and a superhuman, although they will flatly deny any of that. Um, and but it's it's I have absolute respect for them but also the the way that they tell these incredible stories on your channel the the candid nature of of how it was i was uh really deeply moved um and uh, uh, the one uh, episode about uh, the battle of eki uh operasi um just want to shout out to 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 those uh men who told their their story there um Sure, I I was deeply moved, especially in the second uh, half, second episode of 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 that particular um, uh, topic. Uh, it was just the the way that they told it, um, you know, the, and uh, the just the psychological effect that that battle must have had on them. Um, you know, and and to to be able to tell it the way that they did, uh, in a way that was it was informative. We were there. Uh, you know, um, I think of course you, you had it firsthand, but for me, I I saw, I felt, and I smelt. Uh, you know, the 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 war through their through their eyes. Um, I had a firsthand. Uh, idea um so work the guys that you interviewed that were policemen you know the uh, going into the townships um that that fear that absolute terror to, but for them to 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 have uh to, to come out and talk because i wouldn't blame anyone if they were reluctant to to talk about those experiences um but I think that it's also it's a it's a it's a sense of I when when I talk to my my informants and I ask them, is it okay for for you to share this information? And they say it's a catharsis. That's a catharsis. What what uh, and my, as for now, I get the chance to 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 tell my my version of the story uh, to someone who's not just going to shoot me down, um, to someone who's not going to judge me, to someone who's not going to just, um, you know, bear it eight for the year world and then be irresponsible about my story. You, um, you let them tell it the way they want to tell it. Um, and, and for that, I, I commend you actually, because it, it, the, the channel is a, it's a, a very, the, the, the liberal like to talk about a safe space, but your, your channel is truly, um, a space where, 
where where these guys can can go and and just unpack um and i could see it in in uh, the operation crop dave topic uh we at the last the man had gepraat and they and they and they talked and they talked and and they talked they they wanted to say it the way they wanted to um and i've got nothing but respect for them and um yeah it's it, i'm i'm so glad that it is it's it's kept in posterity now It's a funny thing that you mentioned that right? because when we finished with uh, crop day, he came from that, of course, where he came with um, Bob's Amazon. And now we want to talk about Cross Day, which mm. is before he attacked those ships in the Beetle Harbor and sank them. Mm. Then there was apparently some kind of a fight going on before he came. There was a special forces attack on a base which was much more successful. But what's interesting to me about these people is they always say to me afterwards, Chris, I said, I fight, we have to fight, but I was going to have a beer drink. But then what <laughs> you actually see, we're very grateful for the chance to just to be heard. You know? yeah. And I think that's a great thing with legacy. And I don't take any uh, credit for this. You know, as far as I'm concerned, it's from above. That's how mm. it started. I had a dream. Uh, and, and these people really want to talk. I, I recall when I I introduced Rebecca, my wife, to uh, SVF for it. And I knew SVF from a long time before Legacy, and I knew SVF was a legendary operator. And the first words he said to her, and she said to me afterwards, she's traveled more than 100 countries, but she's absolutely never heard anyone say that to her. And and he said, uh, yeah, I'm pleased to meet you. You know, one day I shot down three Cuban helicopters in, uh, in Angola. And she said, <laughs> What does this go serious? <laughs> yeah, no, no, no. He, he was actually there. And then he told his story in, in, in one of his episodes. He's just amazing people. But everyone, the more I speak to the South Africans, the more I realize actually these are special people. Yeah. And, and especially also the Eastern Cape, you know, we can laugh about those consultees there. I mean, I arrived there from the Netherlands. I couldn't speak a word English. I mean, in fact, I murdered a guy at the first day at school because he asked me how was my watch. So he wanted to see my watch. And I thought, yeah. well, I don't know what to watch, but I was so to make you so. Yeah. And, <laughs> We'd better fight. <laughs> running back on the Dell College and Selborne College and all oh, that. Oh, yes. And, yeah. Uh, like a rugby derby is there. Yeah, um, but of course, we would ambush them wherever we could. And they, they were retaliating. And then we had to fight some going on with the surface. But the point I'm trying to make is... <laughs> That is a wonderful part of a country anyway. If you go to King Williamstown and you just drive out, I'm not too sure where now, but there's old forts there, which, which used to yes. be forts there on the copy. And I always yes. thought to myself, oh, these people should be coming here. They should, you should be proud of your history. I mean, we take Stadtrang. I'm sure you'll know better, Jaku. Stadtrang yeah. started by the German soldiers actually in the British Army. Isn't yeah. that true? The Gord, uh, That's Stadtrang. true. Yeah, and, and, and the thing is, there's actually a lot of German influence in um, uh, in, in, in that area, in East London, Stadterheim. Uh, I mean, there's a lot of, like, there's Berlin, which is very close uh, between, I think, um, Stadterheim and uh, East London. There's actually a monument on the promenade um, uh, as, you, as you drive uh, down the promenade of East London near the aquarium. Uh, there's actually a huge statue which is dedicated to the German settlers that came there. Um, yes, so there's a strong heritage of, of, of that there, but also the, the, the English, the, the, the settler, um, you're talking about the forts, you know, there, there are um, homemade forts all over the Eastern Cape, all over the, uh, the frontier country um, where I'm originally from, uh, Kenton on Sea, um just across the river you know in um on your way to port alfred there's um um ah man uh, there's a lot of these small little farmer communities who basically started from set uh, from settlers being dumped there and expected to to farm and and those families have been farming for 200 years you know uh get, it's been kept in there and those forts were designed um to to withstand the the the, the attacks from the Amakasa who would actually uh, launch every now and then an attack from across 
the Fish River. Um, and they, and you talk about people holding on to their heritage. There are many farmers who actually restore those forts uh, that, that have been, I, I know of, of plenty. Um, also, uh, you know, mission stations that, that have been on, uh, on people's farms um, where the farmers actually don't grow anything where the missions uh, where the mission station was or where the graveyard is of the mission station because they wish to to um, preserve it um, you know and that kind of sensitivity towards history I think is also not emphasized enough that there are people and, and as you say the Eastern Cape is actually such a rich um, um, a historically rich area with so many stories to, to tell, you know, they're not, not a non um, uh, with the great cattle famine, you know, what was the real story behind, behind that? Um, you have, uh, you have the, like, like we were talking earlier about the frontier wars or the wars of dispossession. Uh, there are numerous stories, uh, within that, you know, there's the story of Elizabeth Salt, which is also another another story on my channel. Uh, Elizabeth Salt, who who apparently carried a, a barrel of gunpowder to rescue um, soldiers uh, during the Battle of Grahamstown in 18, uh, 18, 1818, um, sorry, 1819, um, and how how that was actually a myth perpetuated by uh, suffragettes. Uh, you know, in 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 the early 1900s, um, so you know, the, 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 we are rich. We are absolutely rich in in beautiful stories. Actually, it's just how we tell them, uh, which will which will the, the, um, that that basically will tell or dictate um, whether the story is worth listening to. Um, so the, the, the information is there, the facts are there, the past is, is, is a treasure trove. It's, it's just how we present it and that we are responsible in, in presenting it in, uh, in a way that is, uh, that, that is truthful to, to the participants from multiple sides. You weet, ons kom van verskillende achtergronde, so... Why don't we tell the story in that way? And if we do that, ons, ons vertel geschiedenis met deernis. As ons het so doen, I think there, there will be no hang-ups um, from, from anyone. So, yeah, um, South Africa, we, we have so much to offer. Um, we have so much to, to, to give. And I know I, I, I'm sounding like uh, one of Madiba's uh, rainbow warriors here. But I really do believe that our history doesn't have to be told from two or more different uh, sources. Um, you know, we there's there's so much we can learn from each other, uh, and I know that sounds cliche as well. But there's so much we can we can learn from either side. We don't have to have a wall between us, uh, a metaphorical wall, when we're talking about about history. There, I mean. Um, the SS Mendy is another case in point where uh, you know that that these guys they came from all over, but they um, they were actually so moved by their white officers, um, they tried to save their white officers uh, to get them off off, off the ship, um, but their white officers also refused to get off because they would rather um, stay with their men. If there weren't enough lifeboats, or if all the lifeboats had been used, then save themselves. Countless of those stories um, exist. Of we going across the the, the the color lines because what I see in front of me is a human, not not a, a color. Um, and I mean, during the 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 uh, Grens Oorlog, countless of those stories. Three two battalion, um, the Ascaris. Um, uh, the Busman Regiment, you know, in um, ah, battalion, sorry, you know, in battalion, these three in battalion, uh, the uh, three in that's it, yeah, um, skis, three two, um, you know, there are stories full of it. That's uh, like they, they always say, 
there was no apartheid in the foxhole, you know. Um, so it, it, that that is some that is the stories that, that that we need to tell, but also in in a responsible and sober way. Um, and I think, because um, between you and I, and I'm, and I'm sure that there are many others out there that are like-minded uh, that we wish to 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 tell those stories. Um, so hopefully, hopefully we keep on doing it, and uh, we carry on, um, we carry on holding that legacy. Yeah, I man, you're always welcome here. If you have something especially interesting there at your channel, just call me, and we put it here as well, and we talk hey, about thank it. You. Yeah. And if you guys out there want to speak about this specific topic, I'm sure the doctor will make make time for you. I will. I like speaking history. I can tell you, I can. Man, I can never stop. I can tell you, I could have gone on now. In the moment you said Bingy, I was thinking of, you know, what happened there with that ship in the English Channel. And a lot of people wouldn't know. So perhaps you should make an a, a episode to say, guys, this is what happened. Know your own history. Sure. We've got sure. absolutely nothing to uh, be uh, ashamed of. Uh, yeah. we, did, we thought it was well. In fact, we thought better than many. And, and uh, yeah. So anyway, what I want to say is, we have to end now because we've been going an hour and a half <laughs> and uh, we can go for another three days, I can tell you. I, I have even, yeah. I'm not one top man. I have a lot of things to say. But guys, seriously, out there, come and talk to us. If you don't want to talk to me, talk to Jakob. But get your story out there so that there's something left behind. Otherwise, the only thing which is going to happen is your children and whoever is going to read the history books I don't want to go in whether they're right or wrong. They're written in certain ways. It, it is, as Yaku said, it is common. It comes from left, it comes from right. It is with all governments. You can't stop that. Uh, but it's very difficult to argue with a man who tells his own story, especially if you were not there, because it's exactly. a testimony. If I say to you, I've done this and this and this and this, it's for you to prove me wrong. And then that way it makes these type of channels uh, so, so valuable. So thank you, Yaku. Thank you for contacting me, man. I'm really grateful. I recommend all of you guys go and look at this channel. I will leave the links here. And and then uh, come and talk to us. And as we say here at, at Legacy, you know, until we meet again, God bless you.